first and foremost, hello. It's so great to see you again. I miss ice coring and all the fun science that goes into it. For those people who don't know, most people don't actually, what is ice coring? Ice coring is a way to utilize the fact that ice caps, the big pieces of ice on Earth, are created by layers of snow that fell over uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, and they preserve all the snow and they pre preserve information about the climate. And we can go up to the ice sheets and core out a cylinder of ice going all the way back uh, to you know as far back as the ice uh, comes from, uh, which in Greenland could be hundreds of thousands of years. And in, in Antarctica, we are trying to get to million year old, old ice. So from this cylinder, which is about this big, we can retrieve all kinds of inf information about past climate. Yes, and I had the amazing experience to see that for myself firsthand. So why did you choose to not only go into the research side, why did you choose to teach as well? Oh, you know, it's it's just nice to meet students all the time and share your enthusiasm about climate, climate uh, physics and, um, you know, geophysics, understanding the mechanisms of the climate. And uh, there's no better way to do that than by sharing it with students. Yes, I 100% agree with that. Um, going back through the layers of times, what exactly does it mean? So you said that they have layers. How can you see the layers? What do you do with those layers? And what do they correspond to? So the layers, they, they come from the fact that, that you know, snow falls most, most, most part of the, parts of the year. So, and they have slightly different characteristics. You can't really see the difference. Uh, if you polish the core, you can see some slight differences in the visual appearance. But you mostly need chemical, physical measurements. Um, in some way to distinguish snow that fell in summer from snow that fell in winter. But in, in doing so, you can you can you can map summers and winters just like you can see tree rings in, in a in a in a tree. And um, in that way you can date the ice. And then from that you can then so also you know choose which pieces to analyze and you know you know what when it happened and what happened, more or less. Awesome. So you said that it's not necessarily visual, but is there anything that you can see visually just by looking at an ice core, or do you need the equipment to actually analyze it? I mean, if you have an ice core from a from a, a, a cold ice sheet, so one which is always frozen on the top, um, you will have uh, tiny bubbles that you can see. You can't see the annual layers, but you can see the, the bubbles that get caught between the crystals. And that's actually one of the nicest features about an ice core is that it contains about 10% of the, of the, of the volume. Uh, is air. So so in compressing uh, snow to ice, we capture tiny, tiny, tiny samples of the, pot, of the past atmosphere. Um, and then when we retreat, retrieve the ice core and we can, uh, we can break the bubbles, basically crush the ice or melt the ice, we can get this atmosphere out and we can measure um, the, com the composition of the past atmosphere that way. So that's the most visually striking thing about an ice core. You can also be lucky, of course, that something makes its way onto the ice sheet. Could be an ash layer from a volcano, or if you're really, really lucky, an insect. But ice sheets are very large, and the risk that you find an insect is almost zero. But tephra, or ashes from, from volcanoes, are, are sometimes found in sea. Yes, I do. I do remember that, seeing that really long ice core, and there was a very stark black layer. And it's like, why is this there? It's so cool that you can see exactly when the volcanoes erupted. Yeah, um, and we and we found that piece for you in the freezer when when you visit it. So yes, I got for, to, so in in a to... three kilometer ice core, there will only be a handful of those at most. There there are many volcanic layers, but most of them are not visible. That the ash will either be in so tiny particles that you can't see them with the naked eye, or not be there at all. And then you can only see the layer from the content of sulfuric acid that was uh, given given uh, off from the volcano and made into the atmosphere. What is the exact name of the machine that you use to figure out the composition of the atmosphere? Oh, there's oh, there are all kinds of machines, okay. and they're all most of them are, are you know handmade, tailor made for the for the purpose, uh, because it is not a uh, mainstream thing to do to analyze ice cores. So most of the equipment is maybe maybe the analysis equipment is something that is used for other things, but the whole process of getting the sample from the ice core into the machine is often something that people built more or less. Um, by themselves in the labs. Interesting, yes. And so you're looking through thousands and potentially even going back millions of years. What are you looking for year by year or even decade by decade? Is there something specific that you're looking for? My, my favorite 
uh, area of, of expertise and you know my, both my favorite and then where I know, I know most about the climate is uh, in the glacial there were some very abrupt climate changes that are nothing like anything we've seen in the current glacial and I I love to study those so uh, so that's um, you know that's my thing so we we go and look for these abrupt changes and we map them out in very very high detail and other research will researchers will have other focus areas they can maybe focus on the greenhouse gases, the CO2 content um, on both very long time scales, million, a million years or very recently, or, you know, whatever, whatever rocks their boat. That is extremely interesting. So you look at the uh, very rapid warming period. So have you seen any that you'd like to mention? I'm, I'm honestly just kind of curious. So is it recent? Is it a million years ago? When have you seen these periods of rapid warming? In the glacial period, which is the most recent one, which started around 120,000 years ago and lasted until 11,700 years ago, we had about 30 of these abrupt events. Um, so they're in, called Dansker Uska events, named after a Danish and a, and a um, Swiss professor who found them first. And they're they're really profound features. Um, and we don't know all about what caused them. This is what makes it interesting, of course, that we can, we still don't know. But uh, they're repeated 30, they repeated 30 times. So there's some kind of system. And then again, not because they're very uh, variable in duration and, 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 um, and spacing. So, so it's, there's still uh, quite a lot of, a lot of uh, kind of mystery in figuring out exactly what, what happened and why. And uh, this is why it's an interesting thing to study. So, 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 that, so that's my thing. And we can't, we can't see them, but we measure isotopes. We measure so isotopes of the water, which reflects the temperature in, of the, of the deposition time. We measure impurities that map what happened in the atmosphere just prior and while things were changing. And then greenhouse gases uh, in, the, in the bubbles. And we, we can see that these abrupt climate changes, they have had a profound impact on the climate system. Many, many things changed over relatively short times and in a very dramatic way. So Greenland saw temperature changes of up to 18 degrees in, in the, about a human lifetime. Interesting. So I know you said about 125,000 to 11,000. We saw these periods of up and down. Is that just naturally occurring within the Earth? And is that something that we are currently going through, that natural warming time? I mean, they are that naturally occurring. Um, humans didn't, didn't play a big role for climate that far back in time. And we're starting to understand which physics uh, is at play when things change back and forth between this, these cold phases and warm phases. Uh, we're currently in it's a glacial, which is a quite different story. It's much warmer now than it was during the glacial. Kind of goes with the name, um, but um, that means that a lot of things are different, and we don't think we will get that exact si uh, same type of climate change in a current per period, because we are simply already in a warm period. So these were were oscillations from a very cold to a medium cold state, and we're already now in a much warmer state. But the physics is the same, and this is why we study them, apart from the curiosity of understanding something. Of course, as a researcher, that's part of what keeps me going. But the other th part is that if we understand the physics of what happened then, we can put that physics into the climate models that we use for present day and for future predictions. So it's not, even though we're not going to see the exact same thing, some of the same physics may be at play. And we are worried right now that the, that the, Thermohaline circulation, so the, the ocean circulation that is driven by temperature and salt, is weakening in the North Atlantic, and that played a crucial role in these abrupt climate changes. So there is an, there is a, a a relevance for future and present climate change, even though it's not a one to one analogy in what happened from, from happened in the future. That is extremely interesting. So using the same physics that you see in past and very normal changes in our climate and applying that same physics to what's going on nowadays, but not necessarily saying we are used to seeing these kinds of events in the past, you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, there, we have to be careful how far we press the analogy because physics doesn't care about what, what, what the time is. I mean, the physics, physics is, is the same in glacials and interglacials, but, but well, how, the, how the, the base conditions, you can see the, what the physics would call in the boundary conditions are different back then from what they are today. So things won't play out in the exact same way, even though the physics is the same. And that's what we're trying to disentangle is how much of this relies on on the boundary conditions and how much is, you know, something that only is specific to the glacial period. Yes. And and but 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 the but the climate models that we use for future predictions and 
you know, basically underpin everything we do politically about what to do about climate change, they rely on this on, on physics. So by by getting a better description of that physics, we hope also to be able to to kind of advance our understanding of of uh, of uh, you know, present and future climate change. Definitely, that is very interesting because looking at the past is the only way to try to figure out what might happen in the future. Um, so you talked about as well the salt comp component of the ocean and the the currents and all that. I do remember a lot of learning about that in our study abroad class. Can you see that in ice cores? And is that another component of ice core drilling? We don't see the exact same thing because this is something that happened in the ocean. Okay. So the so the change in circulation is, is something you would see in sediment cores from, from a marine sediment cores in the ocean. Uh, but we can align them if we have the dating sorted well enough, and that's some of the things that I've been working uh, on in, in large parts of my, my career. If we have the dating sorted well enough, and if we can use those volcanoes that we talked about as as kind of a, um, a, a pin to make sure that we have the, we have the same time in the ocean and in the ice core if we find the same ash layer. So if we have the timing uh, sorted well enough, we can align what happened in the ocean with what happens in the atmosphere, which is what the ice cores record, and then we have a parallel view of what's going on. That's so, amazing. So there's there it's a quite a quite a long stretch and a lot of work to, to tie these things together. But that's what we, we try to do. Because obviously, even though ice cores are fantastic in that they have a very high resolution, we can see year by year, very far back in time, they have there's this problem that that the places where we can drill ice cores are, you know, very isolated. It's the Greenland ice sheet and it's the Antarctic ice sheet. And those are the two only places where the ice cores go as far back as we really want to go. And those are not necessarily the most interesting places because nobody, well, very few people live there. Um, and Greenland people live around the coast, but not where the ice cores are drilled. In Antarctica, nobody lived there ever. So we have climate records from the kind of, you can say the least, the least interesting places. But that's that's how it is with research. You need, you know, you have to get the data from where you can get it, and then you have to make the links to wherever you know you really want to study. And 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 with the marine records, aligning the time and using uh, tephra layers, ash layers, is a way to align things well enough that we can start to to say what is the what is the, the causal relationship, what caused what. Yes. And it took. I mean, when I started studying these many years ago, people were still discussing whether the ocean change caused the atmosphere change that we see in ice cores, or whether it was the other way around. And now we have more or less established that, you know, it's the ocean that is the driving factor. So then the question changes to what made the ocean change? And that's what we're working, working on now. So you're saying that you can't just use ice cores to figure out an exact replica of what happened in the atmosphere. You have to use ice cores and you have to use these ocean sediment cores to figure out what? And lake sediments from 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 lakes on 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 the continents, tree rings, uh, speleothems, so so dripstones from caves, and you have to piece all these bits and, and bits and pieces together, with the dating sorted, which is a crucial thing because if you want to establish what the what the relationship was, not just what happened you know roughly at the same time, but actually what was the series of events, then you need to have the dating sorted, and this is why something like counting annual layers in an ice core, which is pretty tedious, is also important work because if you don't get the right, the dating right, you can't actually build your storyline about what made what uh, change. Yes, definitely. I, I love all this information because again, it's putting together the pieces of the puzzle. Ice cores are really important. Sediment cores are really important. Tree rings are really important. It's all of those together that we can actually scientifically tell you what happened in the atmosphere. Right? Am I getting that right? Absolutely. Wonderful. And and, and and it's going on all the time. People find new records. New records, they have, you know, different records have different strengths. One of the strengths of the green ice cores is that they have this very high resolution. They cover an entire glacial period with annual resolution. That's, you know, very, very few other records can get close to that. But then you find another record from another part of the world, which is for some reason close to where something interesting happened. happened. For example, caves in China, they record the monsoon system and how that changed. We would never see the effect of that in Greenland, of course, because there's no monsoon in Greenland. So by, by, by piecing things together and getting these different data sets with different strengths together, we are able to tell a story which is a lot more comprehensive than we would if we just had 
our two points on Earth, uh, one in Greenland, one in Antarctica. Oh, so interesting. I, I love talking with you, but I'm not going to take up too much more of your time. I just want to ask, why is it important overall to study ice cores in Greenland, and especially Greenland over Antarctica? Because most people only think of Antarctica as our big ice sheet. People kind of sometimes forget about Greenland because the name is Greenland, you know? People think Iceland is the one filled with ice. Some people start, don't even know that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, apart from, again, there, there are two parts to it. There, there's the the scientific discovery part. I mean, we always, we always, you know, try to find new information to understand things we haven't understood. It's just, you know, curiosity drives humans in many ways, and especially scientists, of course, this is what, what we live from. But from a more kind of um, application point of view, the key thing is that, that this is the only way we can test climate models. I mean, climate models are made by taking a lot of physical uh, processes that we think we believe uh, that we th think we understand, put them, putting them together inside a computer, and let them run forward to give us a prediction of what will, what will happen in the future. And you can't get that right. There's simply just too many parameters, too many uncertainties. So if you have no training of your model, it's you know it, it just won't won't work. It's just like you know, people are using AI today for this as well. And what AI does is it's trying to figure it figures out a pattern in what we already know to make a to make a to make a prediction. And, and climate models is kind of the same. I mean, we need to train on something from the past that we know to tune the model, get the param parameters right, get the description of the physics right. And because we can't do tests in, in you know, in, in the climate system, you can say we are doing one, but we can't just you know run run an experiment and then do another experiment, do another experiment. We have to 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 apply you know to use what we have, and what we have is the climate of the past. So we simply have to use all these climate events from on all time scales, from all the data we can, to try to figure out how to describe the physics well enough. And because otherwise we have no, we would have no clue on what would happen in the future. We're pushing um, the climate system into a, a, a realm where it hasn't gone by itself for a long time, I mean, if ever. Um, and so we're a little bit going into uncharted grounds. And, and at, least, at least understanding the mechanisms of physics in that in that area of, of reality is you know that's basically our only our only choice our only way to really have an informed guess about what will happen. Awesome, very interesting. Now, final question. I know I said it was before, but I just thought of something really quick. As a meteorologist, I have noticed that things like the National Hurricane Center and their forecast and rapid intensification they've gotten a lot more accurate over the past couple of years. Is, does that have something to do with the climate data and the modeling, or is that a completely separate tier? No, I think it, it has something to do with it. I mean, some of it is, is, of course, that we now acquire more data, present day data, better coverage, uh, you know, more data points from what is happening right now. And that, of course, makes it easier to make good predictions that we have a better geographical coverage and a better uh, temporal coverage, so maybe a point every second instead of one every minute, or and a point for every 10 kilometers instead of every 100 kilometers. Of course, that helps a lot. But but in terms of getting the physics right, this is where we need the, to study the past. So combining those two, and, and it's not something that is, you know, we, I can't point to where in the climate model does you know, did the ice core improve things, because that's not how it works. But over over generations of, of climate models, and they, you know, they, they, they do evolve, you know, they everything get tuned because the new model did a better job and it did a better job because it we tested it on, on data from the past so this is how it works even though it's a, it's a slow and tedious process yes. and it, and we get access to to climate situations that we otherwise wouldn't i know that 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 you were you had a, a reporter out at the mount, mount uh, sorry um, on a low observatory some time ago yes and 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 where we, from which we know the co2 level but we only know the co2 level of, until you know, from 1958, because this was where they started measuring it. Mm -hmm. If you want to go further back than that, than that you go to an ice core. Yes. Because this, these tiny bubbles they contain, in a in a in an undisturbed way, the atmosphere of the past. So if you if you want to know what the C2 is bef from before before the actual measurements started, you have to go to an ice core. And there are lots of these examples where different kinds of data. They supplement each other, and and we we have ex we have real observational data like temperature measurements, precipitation measurements, CO2 measurements, 
only for a short time. And if we want to extend this back in time, we need to go into the paleo archive, as we call it. So the archive of climate recorded in some kind of record, which could be ice cores or tree rings or or whatever. And and ice cores are really just very good for this because they both capture the air and the precipitation. So if there is a pollution in the atmosphere, we'll see it in the ice. If there's methane or CO2 rise in the in the in the in the air, it'll be recorded in the bubbles. Thank you so much for joining us here at CBS News Bay Area. I had a great time talking with you and I learned a lot. Thank you very much for having me and for remembering what I said in class many years ago. It's hard to forget. <laughs> <laughs>